So this is lecture 11, and today is the 26th of April, 2021. So let's see where we are. We were talking about um, harmonic excitation. of undamped systems, okay? So let's say you have a branch of a tree, right? You are hanging at the tip. You're exerting a load, constant load. Now, instead of this constant load, imagine that due to a harmonic motion of your body, this becomes a sinusoidal load. So we want to see what happens to the maximum displacement of this beam. That's what we are interested, right? So what we did to summarize, we said that if the equation of motion would look like this, okay? This being a sinusoidal load with an amplitude of F naught and uh, the displacement response would be sum of the homogeneous plus particular uh, displacement. Uh, we call this the steady state, this one transient response and the steady state response is as we derived last time was this value where r is the ratio of the forcing frequency to the natural frequency of the system and homogeneous of course part was what we had in other words a uh, response of a freely vibrating system, which would be this. It's not difficult to show that if the initial conditions are zero, that is the displacement and velocity at time equal to zero or equal to zero, uh, the, the total response, which is U, which is UH plus UP will take this form and you can do it for yourself. I don't wanna go through the algebra of that. Um, uh, some of these two, okay, consider that. Then uh, at time equal to zero, put that equal to zero. That is U at time equal to zero is zero. And then take the derivative and equate that to zero. You find A and B, okay as constant, and uh, if you simplify that, you see that the total response would take uh, this form, F zero over K over one minus R squared times one over omega sine omega T minus one over omega N sine omega n t, okay? This is the total response. Of course, if you, instead of r, I put omega over omega n, so you have uh, omega squared minus omega n squared, right? So omega n squared goes to the uh, numerator, so you have f zero, over k times omega n squared, which is k over m. So this becomes f zero over m. So another form of this, if you want to write it that way, would become f zero k um, time over uh, m times omega one omega 
squared minus omega n squared times now what uh, uh, I actually wrote this wrong. This is omega and this is omega. Okay, so it would be that. So that's another form. But anyway, okay. So now, what I want to do, I want to focus on the steady state response as we derived it last time, which is F0 over one minus r squared sine omega t. Let's focus on this because if you have a system starting, let's say, assuming that, okay, the, uh, the, the, the transient vibration had died out, this uh, is the vi vibration of the system response. I want to look at what is the significance of this quantity that we have here. As I told you last time, and I'm gonna redo that here. And in fact, that's how I started lecture by saying that, okay, if you have a static load of that magnitude, F naught, this beam obviously has a stiffness and you want to find the maximum displacement of this beam called that Delta S which is a static displacement, what would that be? That would be simply F zero over the stiffness of that beam, right? Now, let's imagine now that the same force that hang your body that is hanging at the tip of this branch is now moving such that causes a harmonic load of the same magnitude, okay? Same amplitude. What happens, this delta D is going to be now F zero over K times one minus R squared. As I said last time, this is the quantity that magnifies this is static displacement. So we call that a magnification factor. Also, if you look at this quantity, it is a function of R or the function of, you know, frequency of the forcing function because natural frequency is constant, right? For any system. So it's a function of the forcing frequency and it is a very important function. We'll get to that in a minute. We call this also frequency response function. So the frequency response function gives you information about the maximum displacement of a system in the frequency domain. That is, as the frequency of the forcing function increases, what happens? to the maximum displacement of the system compared with the static displacement. So let's look at it, uh, you know, very uh, closely to understand what I mean. This is what I am saying. If you look at this frequency response function is one minus one minus R squared. Okay, so let's look at this function. If R is equal to one, what happens? If R is equal to one, frequency response function goes to infinity. But if R is less than one, okay, if R is less than one, what happens? If R is less than one, this frequency response function is going to be greater than one, right? One, let's say divided by 0.2 is larger than one. And if R is greater than one, okay? 
what happens. That's what I like to see. So instead of this, let's plot this function. And I would plot, since I'm interested in the maximum value, uh, so I would look at the absolute value of this function and plot that versus the frequency ratio. So I'm going to plot this frequency response function, which by the way, is typically shown with this notation, a function of the frequency, okay? So I want to plot that um, against R. So this is one over one minus R squared. That's what I'm going to plot. So you can see that at when R is equal to zero right here, what is the value of this function? One, when R is equal to zero system is not subjected to a dynamic load, right? So that means one means that the response of the system is the same as the static displacement, okay? That's what it means. Now, if R increases, as I said, and approaches one, this is R equal to one. Then what happens? This function increases, goes to infinity. Now, if R further increases, okay, let's say instead of one, you have say 1.2, right? Still is greater than one, but if that R continues to increase, this function reaches a point that let's say at R value of the square root of two, again, becomes one. If you substitute for R equal to square root of two, right? You have one minus two, one. So one over one, so it becomes one again. And if further increases, it goes to zero. As R goes to infinity, this function goes to zero. So this is the frequency response function or represents the response or the maximum value of the displacement is an indicative how the maximum value of the displacement, okay, in frequency domain. This is what we are really interested in vibration and later on, We'll see that in general, we discuss the frequency response function uh, later, okay? And in the lab, you'll see that too, all right? So U, which is that F naught over K, one minus R square sine omega T, this is time domain, time domain response, one over one minus R squared is the frequency domain or the frequency response function. Okay, so now it is, I mentioned one thing and that is when R is equal to one, okay? When R is equal to one, right here, <clears throat> if you look at this function, okay, you can, uh, all your force, you see that when R is equal to one, that is omega is equal to omega N. So you will have U is, go, is going to be this constant value, okay, times one, over omega squared minus omega n squared, right? Sine of omega has become omega n, right? Omega n t. So you will see that um, you have a function that its value is indeterminate and you need to use L'Hopital's rule to 
find the value of that function. In fact, uh, for that matter, you need to use the total response, which we said is F zero over K, what we did, okay, total response, one minus R squared times one over omega N sine omega N T minus one over omega sine omega T. When omega and omega N become the same, what do you have here is zero, and this is going to be also zero, right? So if you want to find out the actual function representing the response in this case, since you have zero over zero, what do you need to do? Use L'Hopital's rule, okay? L'Hopital's rule, take the derivative of the numerator, take the derivative of the denominator, then in that the equation, set omega is equal to omega n. If you do that, you will see that the function, I'm not gonna go through the uh, mathematical uh, derivation of that, but if you perform that, uh, uh, the, you know, the derivation, you will see that the equation that results, okay, u of t would be something of this uh, uh, form that uh, I will just uh, plot that for you, okay? Or the response would, yeah, the actual form of the response, it can be shown would be something like this. Okay, that's what the response looks like. So if you plot this, you see that it looks, if this function looks something like this. It's this function, its amplitude increases with time Okay, and as time goes on, goes to infinity, the amplitude of the function goes to infinity. This phenomenon called resonance. What I want you to do is actually, it's a good mathematical practice. I don't wanna do it because it's gonna take a lot of time of the lecture and go through just mathematical derivations. But it's not difficult. You just take this function, okay? Take multiple, you know, take a common denominator here and write it as an uh, algebraic expression, which is a fraction. Take the new derivative of the numerator and the denominator, and in that, then put omega equal to omega n. Then that's the function you will um, see that it will result, okay? And then plot that, and you will see that use Excel or whatever, and plot that, and you see you have a function that is amplitude increases with time. This is a very important phenomenon observed in real uh, world, that if you have a system which is undamped, especially, of course, there is no such a thing as undamped, but very, very low damp, and subject that to a frequency, a forcing function whose frequency, of course, harmonic, is close to the natural frequency or becomes the natural frequency, system basically collapses. Somebody actually in the previous uh, section mentioned that example, which is historically a very well-known uh, example of the uh, collapse of a structure the uh, famous McKinnon uh, suspension bridge that was designed and they, at the time um, of the design, they had not accounted for the flow induced vibration, vibration of the beam due to the wind load. 
And it happened that the frequency of the wind blowing at that day was such that resonated with the natural frequency of this suspension bridge and the whole bridge, I mean, started vibrating, vibration increases, the magnitude increases, and then bridge collapse. There's a movie of that, that like they show there's one car going over the bridge. The poor driver senses that the bridge is moving, gets out of his car and runs, uh, you know, fast to get off the bridge. And then he watches the collapse of the bridge. But anyway, that's a historical example. And in any case, you don't want that to happen. So what you do is you, if you have even a uh, case that, for instance, the forcing frequency is harmonic and uh, you would pass that uh, a case, a phase of resonance very fast. Let me give you an example. Let's say in jet engines, right? So you would say, okay, the uh, you have a heavy engine, right? And uh, it, of course, starts and the frequency is zero, but should increase, right? So at some point, it has to go through that resonance, but they make sure that this goes way, uh, you know, uh, far away from the resonance is very, very high. So in fact, what happens here, if you look at this case, if this frequency response function gives you a very, a lot of very interesting information. If the frequency of the forcing function is less than, okay, less than square root of two, okay? You see that, or this ratio is less than square root of two. It's the, the maximum displacement due to this dynamic uh, load is always greater than F zero over K, because this is greater than one. But if, the ratio is greater than square root of two. In other words, if not free for the forcing frequency is greater than square root of two times natural frequency, it's very interesting that the maximum dynamic displacement is, falls always below the corresponding static displacement. In other words, if somebody tells you, wait a minute, here is a, Again, going back to that example of the tree, you're hanging on it, okay? So the tree is displaced, right? So somebody tells you, oh, please don't move. If you move, it's going to break, right? Theoretically speaking, if you move such that the frequency of your harmonic, harmonic motion that you're inducing here, okay, is much, much larger than the natural frequency of this branch, in fact, you will never get reach this static displacement or the displacement of this branch, in fact, would be less than the static displacement that this branch experiences due to your weight. Why? This is why, okay? Because you're somewhere here. And the faster you move, in fact, the less displacement this beam is going to experience. That's why when we have this jet engines, right? Wing of the airplane, you have these two huge, heavy engines. They operate, right? You don't even notice that this, and in reality, this beam or the wing even moves because this frequency ratio is so high that almost you're here. So you don't even experience any static displacement of this wing. So that's why this frequency response function, it is very important to understand that, okay?
There are other observations you can also make in case of uh, harmonically excited system. Again, if you look at this uh, uh, steady state response, this is the steady state response, right? One minus R squared sine omega t. So if you plot the forcing function, if this is a forcing function, F naught, right? Is sinusoidal function, right? Where this is F naught. Now, so what does this tell you? It tells you if R is less than one in the time domain, okay, the frequency of this and the frequency of the forcing function are the same. But if R is less than one, this amplitude is also going to be positive. So it's gonna be like this. So if this is the forcing function, the displacement increases in the same direction that the forcing function is increasing. If this is positive, it is positive. So we call this in phase. If R is greater, less than one, frequency is go back to frequency response function or less than one, although the response is increasing, increasing, but increases in the same direction as the force. So we call them in phase. If R is greater than one, what happens? This is negative. Still, of course, you have the same frequency, but it is negative. The, the sign of the amplitude of the response and the forcing function are the opposite. So we call this odd of phase, okay? That's what happens in the case of uh, harmonically excited systems. Let's look at something else, make another interesting observation. Uh, and that is uh, what you also see in the lab. Again, you'll do actually an experiment. Uh, and that is uh, the, con the uh, concept of um, beating phenomenon, beating phenomenon. What is beating phenomenon? It happens that um, you may not have resonance in the system, but ratio of the frequencies are such that forcing frequency is almost close to the natural frequency. So let me say this, let's say, for instance, the difference of these two is very small. For the sake of, but it is not zero. Are one of those supposed to be omega n or? Oh, omega n, right, yes, yes. Thank you. So let's say the difference between these two is a very, very small number. I call that two delta omega. Yeah, okay, you can call that delta omega, but I do that for the mathematical derivations that I will do right now. So one over one minus R squared, which is what? Is omega N squared over omega squared minus omega N squared becomes this, right? So I want to substitute for these this value. What is omega? Omega, um, let me do this. Let me take, uh, you know, basically uh, write this like this, negative, okay? Omega N squared divided by omega N squared minus omega squared, okay? Now I write omega N squared minus omega squared is what? is omega n plus omega times omega n minus omega, right? Algebra. I call this, okay, to be what? Go here. This is 
omega minus omega n was two delta omega. So this is negative two delta omega. And these two are almost the same. So omega and omega n are almost the same. So this is like two omega n. So the end result is negative four omega n delta omega. So let's bear that in mind, okay? Now, we said that the total response of the system was what? F zero over K one minus R squared times if the initial conditions were zero, one over omega sine omega T minus one over omega N sine omega N T, okay? Again, in this expression, I would substitute for R, which is omega over omega N. And so this instead becomes F zero M, because if you substitute for this comes, let me do that. You have F zero over K. Uh, you have one minus omega squared over omega N squared. So this becomes omega N squared. This goes to the numerator. So omega n squared is k over m, okay? So this cancels out with this. So you get F zero over m times omega n squared minus omega squared times one minus one over omega sine omega my one over omega n square sine omega n t, okay? Now, um, and uh, what I will do, I would, uh, in fact, uh, okay, uh, I will multiply this by omega and divide this by omega. But what I do instead, I would take this omega inside here. So you have omega over omega sine omega t minus omega over omega n sine omega n t. I'm doing a little bit of uh, a trick here. So these two are, this is of course cancel out. These two are almost the same. I can say this is also equal to one. So therefore, this part, which is what I was doing becomes what? Becomes sine omega t minus sine omega n t. From trigonometry, you remember that sine alpha minus sine beta can be written as minus two sine alpha minus beta divided by two cosine alpha plus beta divided by two, okay? So I would substitute for these, they're equivalent, okay? So this becomes negative two sine omega n minus omega divided by two t cosine omega n plus omega over two T. But this was two delta omega. So I get two sine delta omega T cosine, and this is two omega N. So this is two omega N. So this becomes cosine of omega N T. Okay, so the whole U then becomes, U becomes F naught over M, okay, sine of delta omega T, okay, divided by M, divided by, again, I have in the denominator, I had what? I had omega n minus the square minus that, which I had done that before. You had 
de omega n times delta omega cosine omega n t. But let's forget about this constant part, okay, or this. What you have now, it is a sinusoidal function whose amplitude is in fact a sinus a, a function like this. If you plot this and do it for yourself, you see that this is what you will ob observe. The plot of this function looks like this. You have a, let me plot that and then I will tell you what happens. You will get a sinusoidal function, okay, that goes like this. that its amplitude, okay, is a sinusoidal function, but the function itself, it, you know, as time goes on, its amplitude is increases a sinusoidal way, but goes to zero, increases, goes to zero, and this, change in the maximum value of this function is such that follows a sinusoidal pattern or the change in the amplitude of this function is follows a sinusoidal function. This is called beating phenomena. It happens when you have two systems that have almost the same frequency. In other words, a system, of course, in this case, what we did, we said that system has a frequency that is very close to the natural frequency of the system, okay? If you have two systems with very, very close frequency, but not identical, this is what happens. Give you an example. You're sitting in an airplane, okay? with two propeller engines. I don't know if you have ever experienced that. These two are operating supposedly at the same frequency, but there is no such a thing exactly the same. So they're very, very, very close. So if you're sitting in the, along, in fact, in the row, which is along the wing of this plane, you can literally sense that sound or the motion that goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down to zero, or disappears, goes up, goes to zero. You can, if, I'm, I'm not sure if you've experienced that or not. Or those of you who are familiar with, I mean, you're especially music, playing some kind of an instrument. If two players playing violin, right? You're supposed to play in the same frequency, right? But it's not exactly the same. You hear the sound goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. That is the beating phenomenon. All right. Any questions? Yeah, can no? we go back to the previous page? There's some algebra I don't really understand. Maybe here? Yeah, like at the top of the page as well. Top of the page here, you mean? Here? Yeah. Um, so what I did, I multiplied it by omega and divided by omega, right? But this part becomes what is here becomes this, right? The, the minus four omega n times delta w, and then it be, I don't know where what that is at the top of the page. Oh, top of the page, this one? A bit, a bit lower, yeah, the four version. It's like minus four omega n times delta w. Oh, this one, I see, I see. This one, since these two are almost the same, 
you can say that this is two omega n, omega n plus omega. This is very close to omega. So it's almost two omega n. This one from here, I said that I assume the difference between these two is a very small number. So it's two, I call that two delta omega. So that's what I set up as the value for the difference of these two. So that's why the multi when you multiply these two becomes four times omega n times delta omega. Is that the question? Yeah, and then also oh. at the bottom of the page. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a point where we go from f naught over m times omega n squared minus omega squared to something with no f naught and no m. Yeah, to just omega over omega sine omega t. Oh, no, no, I, um, yeah, I think I, as I was going through, since this constant part is not important, I just dropped it. I, this may not be correct because I just wanted to focus on this part. So please uh, follow that, see if I made a mistake or not. So I'm glad that you did. You were very closely following it, but that's all it comes down to. That's what I want to focus on. Rest of it is a constant value. So it may not be that I did not, substitute thing correctly, which I agree with you, but that's what I care about. And if you plot this function, that's what it looks like, which is called the beating uh, uh, phenomenon, okay? All right. So with that said, okay, let me do just one example um, uh, problem and then, um, we basically done. We are basically done with uh, this uh, uh, topic. Okay, so let me do an example. Let's say this is a typical type of a problem you encounter in this uh, case. Let's say you have an undamped system subjected to a forcing function. And this forcing function is of this uh, of given value. The stiffness is given as 40 pound per inch. Weight of this is given as 38.6 pound force. We, we know that as this is, uh, it is subjected to this uh, forcing function, the initial conditions are zero, okay? We just want to uh, find the time displacement response of this uh, motion. Very simple problem, okay? So, if you're given a problem like this, don't start from scratch. You know that the total response is always the initial condition dependent part plus, which we call that homogeneous or transient response plus the uh, a steady state response. Forcing function is of a cosine form. So in this case, that's what you have. So if forcing function is F zero sine omega T, the steady state response would be F zero over K times one minus R square sine omega T. If forcing function is like this, uh, F not cosine omega T, this would be a cosine function. So that's the, in this case is a cosine. So that's what the steady state response will be like, right? So the initial conditions are given, U of zero at T on zero is equal to zero. So you put T is equal to zero here. So this becomes one, this is zero, and this becomes one. So A then, would be negative F zero over K over one minus R squared, okay? F naught is 10, K is 40 pound per
per inch, okay? R, which is omega over omega n, is omega, which is 10, over what is omega n? Is k over m. k is 40. This is 38.6 divided by 32.2 times 12. Convert that to pound mass. So that's 386. So R comes out to be 0.5. Okay. F0 over K would be uh, 10 over 40. So would be 0.25. So substitute these in here, you get A is equal to negative 0.25 over one minus 0.5 squared comes out to be roughly 0.5. 33 inches, okay? So that's the value of A or, or neg negative, of course, okay? Now, um, for B, you need to take the derivative, okay? And you see that if you take the derivative of that function, derivative of that q dot would be what? Would be negative omega n a sine omega n t plus b omega n cosine omega n t plus f zero over k one minus r squared times negative omega sine omega t. So t equal to zero, which is u dot zero. Uh, this would be one, this is zero, this is zero. So that gives us b is equal to zero. So therefore u, total u would be then just A times cosine omega n t. Omega n was what? K over m, which was 40 divided by 10. Square root of that, omega n was 2. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, 20 radius per second. Okay. So, um, okay. And so this would become negative 0.33 cosine 20 T minus cosine 10 T. That would be the total response. So if you wanna, if you wanna find the maximum value of this, you can either plot that or take the derivative down, you know, set time equal to zero to find the maximum value. But that's basically the time response of the system, okay? So I think, I don't think we have time to do any more problems. I'm gonna stop here and answer any questions. Or if you don't have any question now, see me during my office hours.